with its palm-fringed beaches, shimmering white sand and crystal clear waters. The West Indies is many people's idea of being as close to paradise as you can get. During the 1980s, though, it was also, if you were a cricketer, a sort of living hell. Oh, it's in there too. He's got him. He's out. The home to the greatest cricket side the game had ever seen, they were the undisputed world champions with an unbeaten run of 18 series in a row. It was against this backdrop then in early 1990 that Graham Gooch brought a young and very inexperienced side to the Caribbean. No one gave them a chance, and yet during the two and a half months they were here, they nearly produced one of the greatest sporting upsets imaginable. And with them to witness what was a tour of drama and no little controversy, the fledgling Sky TV, who were to make history of their own and revolutionise the coverage of international cricket. This is Pictures from Paradise. We were in a battle with a rival satellite company. Six months earlier, I'm playing Durham against York. Now, there I am playing against Viv Richards. Devin Markham has struck a mighty blow for England. That's the second time Mosley has taken Gooch on the hand. Gooch appeal, Viv Richards has given him. The umpire wasn't going to give that. It's late September 1989, and for English cricket, a summer to forget has thankfully reached a conclusion. The Ashes have been lost 4-0. A rebel tour to South Africa has decimated the ranks of those eligible to play for their country. Rarely has the nation's summer sport stock been so low. Rock bottom. <laughs> End of 89 against the Australians, and being um, thrashed having won the Ashes in Australia two years before. Obviously, huge disappointments, and um, something had to be done. So it was that the England selectors convened to pick a side to take on the mighty West Indies, who'd only lost one test match in their own backyard in the previous 12 years. Amongst them, the new captain, Graham Gooch, who straight away on arrival was told that two of the biggest names in the English game, Ian Botham and David Gower, were not to be considered for selection, a decision that caused a national outcry. There was a lot of press, a lot of media attention. It was all over the place. I think there were questions in Parliament. Why isn't David Gower selected for a tour of the Caribbean? He was still a fabulous player, etc. But also because David was my hero growing up at university a few months earlier at Durham, I would have had a picture of David Gower up on my wall in my university room. That's how sad I am. It was quite simple about no David and no Ian. I was just told they won't be considered. The upshot was a very raw and inexperienced squad that boasted 197 caps between them, and 130 of those belonged to Gooch and Lamb. In contrast, the West Indies team for the first test in Jamaica would total 538. The players weren't due to set off for the Caribbean until mid-January, but that didn't stop the planning and the preparation for what was seen as a cricketing mission impossible. Look, in, in my previous tours, I reckon um, you could get on the plane to wherever you were going in the world, having done absolutely nothing apart from go for the appointment for your medical. Um, and once you've had your medical, then you could get onto the plane. It was brilliant. You know, that's all I knew is that you trained hard, you prepared to then go away on tour. Whereas, you know, before then, I think they just used to meet at, at the airport. I loved it. I actually loved it, yeah. I, I, I thought it was, it was, physically it was tough, you know. I mean, I can still see, see players being sick at uh, Lily Shaw and various other places around the country that weren't used to the fitness. But I loved every minute because I used to think, well, if I'm fitter, then I'm not going to get tired, I won't make mistakes, so I'm going to play better. And Jack, of course, being Jack, also took things to another level. I'd go in the sauna with my long sleeve sweater on, my batting gear, my helmet, and just jog around and just, like, move up and down and play a few shots, and uh, everybody in there looking through the steam could think, well, who's this crackpot here? <laughs> just, who is this guy and what's he up to? But to me, it was just logical. I mean, I know it might sound eccentric, Charles, but to me, it seemed perfectly natural. Plus over 200 hours of first-class international cricket. As it happens, England's cricketers weren't the only one making preparations for the trip. 
The previous February, a new broadcaster had emerged on the UK television scene in the guise of Rupert Murdoch's Sky TV. Amongst their senior staff was David Hill, who'd made his name covering Kerry Packer's World Series. We had Sky and we had Sky Movies and we had Sky News. And um, the, the naysayers were many and loud. Um, and so what we thought we'd do would be that we needed some um, uh, top-level sport on, on the network. IMG came to us. Bill Sinrich from IMG came to us and said that he had acquired the rights to the English tour of the West Indies. And I went to Mr Murdoch and I said, this is going to be a bit of a reach. It's never been done before. It comes into England at a great time. Um, and I think it would be really good for us. And I'll never forget Rupert Murdoch announcing to the assembled company, we've come up with a miraculous way of getting 250 hours of live pictures back from the West Indies for the first time. And at this point, I'm the only person on the production. No one else has been has joined yet. And I'm sitting there thinking, no, we haven't. What's he talking about? We haven't found any sort of way to do this yet. What have I let myself in for? Back at home, as the new year dawned, the cricketing preparations were stepped up, with batsmen sent to Leeds for unforgettably intense sessions with former England batsman Geoffrey Boycott. You can be one of the best players in the world, but if you don't get the bat and ball in your hand and perform your skills, practice them, get in the middle of match practice, you're not really much good, and that is the biggest problem. It would be fair to say that he was not everyone's cup of tea, and um, he's straight to the point, very frank, very blunt, and he stood, um, I would say, about 17 yards down the pitch uh, in the indoor nets with the, some of the local academy bowlers at Yorkshire and encouraged them to bowl the same length as the West Indies used to bowl. I remember getting up there, meeting Boycott for the first time, and he sort of looked at me up and down and just must have thought, what have we got here? And I think he said, you're not at university now, Hussein, get your pads on. When we got there, first of all, he said, look, you know, you've all done well to get selected. Um, you generally played against one West Indian quick in county cricket at a time. This time there's going to be four or five. So any half volleys or little 75, 80 mile an hour medium paces, it's not going to happen. And you'd bat for 45 minutes straight with the ball coming at your head, coming at your chest, shoulder, whatever, and you had to deal with it. Sir Geoffrey had uh, young academy bowlers from uh, Yorkshire bowling off about 17 yards in the indoor school. At one stage, I had one that went straight through my uh, visor and, and broke my nose completely. To this day, you know, I've never faced a ball that quick. I refused to go into the nets, um, which upset uh, Boycott. I'm sure Boycott said, well, if he's not going to play in the nets, he shouldn't go on the tour. Well, so so wh wh why didn't you want to have a net? Well, I wasn't going to get bombed from 17 yards. You know, I like a fair competition from, from 22 yards. For some of the new boys, there was also another novel experience, a day's filming with Sky for a promotional campaign which was set to a David Hill written song entitled, possibly a little optimistically, Young Lions Are Going To Roar. We got to Sky and, and we, we were all in this gear. I had my MCC touring jumper on. I was playing pull shots at these balls coming at two miles an hour. And the, the, the worrying feeling was that we may have just overbilled ourselves a little bit in that advert. Myself, Nasser Hussain, Angus Fraser, Devon Malcolm, we went to the film studio and we, um, yeah, there was an advert made, which at the time was, was massive. Um, so it was a bit of fun, you know, it was fun and we had a laugh about it. But yeah, you could say a film star, but no Oscars. When the promo came out on Sky TV, all I saw with myself with a bat in my hand playing shots and all that business, and I keep saying, up oh, they got this totally wrong. The tour finally got underway on January the 25th, when England flew into Barbados for early acclimatisation. They then played three first-class warm-up games. They drew with Jamaica and the Leeward Islands, but lost by one wicket to the Windwards. The covers are still on the ground, and so the news is not good. There were also two one-day internationals, but both were badly affected by the weather and ended with no results. Spectators trying to cover as much of themselves as possible. 
By February the 24th, though, it was down to the real business, as the first test got underway here in Jamaica. And it's probably fair to say that most people could only see one outcome. What I do remember is before the test match, because, I mean, we're playing against a great West Indies side, uh, the number one in the world. Mike Walters in the Daily Mirror, uh, they'd done a double-page spread as a build-up, and on one page it had the West Indies fast bowlers, which was like Ambrose, Marshall, Walsh, Patterson, whoever, Bishop, people like that. And on the other page, it was like myself, Devon Malcolm. So it had top guns on one page and pop guns on the other. Uh, so <laughs> that, that, I remember that being uh, something that appeared in the Daily Mirror. If you look at what had happened before the couple of series before, we, we'd won those series quite convincingly. So we are obviously very confident. The fact that we had a good record over the last couple of years and that we were playing at home. We were all staying in the same hotel as the team and the tension in the breakfast room that morning, I, I said good morning to quite a few old friends in the team who just looked so apprehensive. Some of them just blanked you totally and they were obviously mentally, utterly concentrated and prepared and I, I had the gravest feelings that things were going to go badly wrong. I didn't sleep. I mean. Six months earlier, I'm playing Durham against York or Leeds, Bradford University. The next day, I'm playing against Viv Richards and Gordon Greenwich and Desmond Haynes and possibly facing Patrick Patterson. He wasn't the only one who'd had a sleepless night. The one thing I, I do recall about uh, producing television in the West Indies is the phrase, soon come. And you hear that when you say things like, but where is the generator? And you hear, don't worry, soon come. And you say, we are on the air in 30 minutes. And without the generator, we will not be on the air. Don't worry, soon come. Um, my hair used to be black. Uh, I, you see the color now, and I, I believe that the West Indies tour had a lot to do with it. To start with, nothing remarkable happened. The West Indies won the toss, and Greenwich and Haynes launched the innings with a solid and incident-free opening partnership of 61. That's a beautiful shot. And look how that ball runs. Almost no need to chase. But then, just before lunch, everything changed. Gordon Greenwich, Desmond Haynes are having one of their normal sort of, um, you know, solid opening partnerships. Uh, Gordon was a you know, brilliant player, one of the best openers of all time. Shots all around the wicket. They were brilliant. They were smashing us everywhere, playing it so easily. And the uh, ball's glanced down the fine leg by Gordon Greenwich. And it's gone to Devon. Now, Devon can't catch, can't feel, can't stop the ball. And the first thing that flashed through my mind is that Mickey had spent an, a, quite, a, quite a lot of time and had zeroed in on Dev because he wanted him to be a better fielder. Just before Dev had let one through his legs on the boundary and Mickey Stewart jumped up and he was going, he was going ballistic at Dev because he'd been putting a lot of work in. And Mickey Stewart was just by me shouting, Dev, 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 keep your eye on the ball. So Mickey's got all excited that the, the ball's coming to Dev and he's waiting for him to do this brilliant piece of fielding. He's been working with him so hard. Oh, he's fumbled that one. And it missed my hand totally, cracked me on the side of my knee, and he fumbled the ball. And Mickey jumped up again, and he was going mad at Dev again. Well, it bounced out in front of him, and then bounced quite kindly, and landed right in his right hand. He's got into a position to throw the ball, and of course, we all know that Dev's very, very powerful. And in one swoop, I picked the ball up, and like an exercise missile, I send it to Jack Russell. And they're coming back for a second. It's a good throw. This could be out. He's got him. Yes, he's got him. He's got him. And I would say it's probably the flattest, quickest throw I ever received over the top of the stumps in my life. I actually took it right there, and I didn't have to move. Took the bears off, and um, Winnie's was probably two yards out. And I could hear Mickey Stewart shouting, Dev, Dev, you beauty. I don't believe you were going to say beauty if I, if, I, if I didn't recover mine. Beautiful throw in there from the deep. Devon Malcolm fumbled the ball, in came the throw, and boy, over the bales it was. 
Oh, it's in the end. He's gone in. He's out. After that, it was all England as the West Indies collapsed in dramatic fashion to 164 all out as England's carefully laid plans worked to treat. We decided we were going to give them nothing to score on the leg side. Absolutely nothing. In fact, we were not going to bowl at the stumps. We were going to bowl in the channel, in Jeffrey's corridor of uncertainty, you know, six, nine inches outside off stump. And if they left it, we would play the patience game. And it worked. Oh, big appeal there, but he's got it, he's got it, Bert Richards going for the pull shot, and Devon Malcolm has struck a mighty blow for England. Well, I went through the tail. I mean, you've got to, some days you're going to get the top order batsman out, but I had sort of went through the tail. I, mean, I think it was like the first ball after tea. I was bowling down the hill, and Carl Hooper played an ordinary shot, tried to clip one and chip one to mid, mid on uh, for a catch, and then I just went boom, 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 and probably got four wickets in, in five or six overs. Ian Bishop out first ball, and Angus Fraser is on a roll. He's brilliant, and you know, I know he's north of the river, but we're good mates. I have that much respect for Gus um, and loved him as a bowler because you knew what you were going to get from him. Bang on target, and that is the end of the West Indian innings. Well, I played with Angus at Middlesex, and that was his strength, you know. He bowls line and length, and, you know, he, he ran in and bowled all day. He had the attitude to bowl long spells, so, you know, he was a guy who was very useful for England, especially in the Caribbean. Now it was down to the batsmen to capitalise on the work of the bowlers. Nice-looking shot for four. Gooch and Larkins got them off to a solid start with 40 for the first wicket, but the key innings came from Alan Lamb, who made 132 and put on 172 with Robin Smith for the fourth wicket. That'll get down to the boundary. So four runs, very well played there by Lamb. Alan Lamb batted magnificently. I mean, he had the reputation of being able to play the quicks and, and arguably this is probably one of his finest innings. Lammy was a great test match batsman. I, I can't remember how many test match hundreds he got against West Indies. I think it's about six in that era. So he had the game for it. And Robin, Robin obviously was like a younger version of, of Alan. That'll go all the way. The outfield here very fast at Sabina Park. So a boundary to Robin Smith. He'd been brought up, obviously, in, in Durban a little bit, and, you know, his game was built on the cut shot, and, you know, he was, he was, he was a punisher of a ball, and, uh, you know, they enjoyed that sort of challenge. Absolutely cracked on the ground by Lamb. They were two tough cookies. You know, Lamb's got loads of hundreds against them, Judge got quite a few, but I think they had their basic game plan. There's not a lot you can do when the ball's here all the time. So you have to work a plan out, and those guys worked it out to a tee. One that's a half century for Robin Smith. Raises the bat to the dressing room. How well he's played, a gutsy innings. I think what I, I did with Robin, I said, we've got to alternate the strike. You know, we, we, what we, we don't want to be bogged down at one end where they can bowl six balls at you. Let's look to get the ones, and if they do bowl a bad ball, hit it for four. And, and that was the attitude we had. Tremendous shot, wonderful performance, a century to Alan Lamb. Well played, the vice-captain. It was a match-winning partnership. By the time England were bowled out for 364, they had a lead of 200. Amongst the lower-order contributors, Jack Russell with a rather lucky 21. Walsh with a bit of spring in his stride now. Through to the wicket keeper, up they go in the slips cordon, but he didn't nick that one. The first ball actually faced, I edged it to the keeper and nobody appealed. So my actual debut in the West Indies could have been, it could have been with a golden duck. I, luckily I got away with it. Your big mate, Courtney Walsh, did you tell him afterwards? Uh, no, I don't think I ever told him that, so he's going to find out now, isn't he? Yeah, I can still see it now, I can still feel it, just feathering the bat. But uh, to my astonishment, nobody appealed, so I wasn't going to complain. Jack Russell wants one, he's off the mark, it's a good feeling. There's nothing worse than being out there on naught. And things didn't get any better for the West Indies when they batted again. They were bowled out for 240 in 72 overs, with the decisive blow being landed by Devon Malcolm. He'd taken one wicket in the first innings when he had trapped Viv Richards' LBW for 21. Second time around, he ended up with four for 77, with the most spectacular strike, Viv. Again, this time, clean bowled. Bowling! 
Vincent Yoka, the king of the West Indies, is on his way back to the pavilion, bowled by Devon Malcolm. I was just embarrassingly uh, uh, um, happy, so to speak, you know, a lot. I mean, I felt like jumping up and punch the skies and all that business, but and even so, Charles, there was still a level of respect for the Master Blaster. Well, he broke the Greenwich Haynes partnership by rolling Haynes over, and what has he done? He's come up with a little jaffer to get rid of the captain of the West Indies. You know, pitched it up there and all that business, that Viv, you know, anything short, Viv will take it on. I know it was a perfect in-swing in Yorker. Viv went to hit it a little bit too square, right through bat and pad and rock back the leg stump. You know, it was a great sight to see. You could sense that, that Devon had rattled him. Devon's sort of hostility, his rawness. I think that delivery, that ball that got rid of Bibridge has shocked the entire crowd. You know, obviously there were some English people there and they would have been rejoicing, but I think the rest of the entire ground were in shock. It was very silent. Who's this guy? Got Viv Richards out once? Twice? No, 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 no. That doesn't happen very often. Well, I'll tell you for sure, it ain't a good time to go and ask for his autograph. The reaction was, for me, was always more that Viv has gotten out you know, had gotten out early because it tended to change the complexion of things. We always knew that he was a quick bowler. You know, he had an action where that every time that he delivered a ball, he looked as though he's going to hit it halfway in the wicket. So he was one of those guys that you're never going to really venture out on the front foot too early for. England needed just 41 to win the game. They lost Gooch for eight, but on the stroke of lunch, Wayne Larkin sealed it. Yes, he's just been there. And I remember him raising his arms up like that, and you know, what, what, what a moment for him, being plucked out of obscurity from domestic cricket to come back and play for his country when he would probably never ever thought that was going to happen. Astonishing for England, astonishing for the West Indies too. They cannot believe it. They haven't lost a match on this ground for 35 years. We deserve to be where we are because we played some really good cricket. So. It just showed what a closely knit group of excited and ambitious young people can achieve, really. Nobody expected the West Indies to lose. People knew there was going to be a battle, yes, but they didn't expect a loss. And that would have been a big shock. I've got some great photographs from the dressing room with us enjoying. Like you see with most people when they're serious wins, you know, with the beer flowing over the coaches' heads and things like that. We got a telegram from the Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, so I thought, oh, we've done something special here, and the team room afterwards was very lively, uh, with people dancing to Tina Turner, Simply the Best. That's the, those are the things that stick in my mind. And England, of course, were not the only ones celebrating. The fact England won that Jamaica Test match, I mean, was the genesis, if you like, of Sky Television, I think, quite honestly. The gamble paid off after that first test. It was people had to see it. They'd, they'd heard it on the radio, but when they suddenly realised that they could actually watch a series from the West Indies if they had Sky, and this opened a whole new world to England's cricket fans. So they went out and bought dishes, and more dishes and more this dishes. This is the Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad, and in late March 1990, it was the setting for one of the most controversial and dramatic test matches this famous old ground can ever have seen. It was a match which saw dramatic collapses. Got him! He's gone! We got quite excited. Vicious, bone-breaking bowling. He's taken Gucci on the hand. Gucci in absolute agony. Tempers boiling over. And straight away the bouncer whizzing over the top of that white crash helmet. As long as I'm in charge of the team, he's going to get plenty of them. And accusations of cynical time-wasting. What a carry-on, my goodness. All of it watched by an enthralled audience in the UK. We were in a battle with a rival satellite company. Six months earlier, I'm playing Durham against York. Now, there I am playing against Viv Richards. Devon Malcolm has struck a mighty blow for England. That's the second time Mosley has taken Gooch on the hand. Gooch appealed, Viv Richards has given him. The umpire wasn't going to give that. Three weeks earlier, England had stunned the cricketing world by beating the mighty West Indies by nine wickets in the first test match in Jamaica, 
sending shockwaves right around the Caribbean. Yes, he's misfielded. I think it's the one. Fantastic. We deserve to be where we are because we've played some really good cricket. So it just showed what a closely knit group of excited and ambitious young people can achieve, really. Nobody expected the West Indies to lose. People knew there was going to be a battle, yes, but they didn't expect a loss. And that would have been a big shock. The players weren't the only ones celebrating. The fledgling Sky TV had taken an enormous gamble by buying the rights to televise the series live back to the UK, something which had never been done before. With that Larkin's off drive, though, the gamble had paid off. The gamble of putting it on, having an England team that was developing its own personality, developing its own stars, and developing its own style, and, and that first test changed everything. There's a great piece by Tim Rice on the back page of the Times in February 1990. He says something like, I've seen the future of sport and it's a dish. It, it, it was all new. I mean, it was new to me. One just didn't know what was coming up. All I knew was that we were going to get an exciting test series, ball by ball, live. Back in London, the Sky publicity department, never one to miss an opportunity for the big sell, immediately started to ramp up the second test in Guyana, only to be thwarted by the weather. After a couple of one-day internationals, which the West Indies won, the test match never saw a ball bowled as heavy rain every night of the game left the border ground underwater. I remember going to the ground one day with Tony Cozier and down to the, the border and just looking on the outfield and I saw a fish. We were never going to play. Despite all the unexpected downtime, one of England's new faces still managed to pick up an injury. We'd have a bit of cricket practice, just us youngsters used to go down because we were probably getting bored or, or annoying other people. So we used to go on the tennis court, have a bit of cricket and then a bit of tennis. I was looking out the window and Richie Richardson was playing Viv Richards at tennis. So I thought, I'll have a bit of this, I'll go and watch that. And then Stewie came down, I said, Stewie, come on, let's show him how to do it. We'll go and play some tennis as well. And the courts were a little bit slippy and Viv and Richie Richardson just sort of looked at us, walked off. Nass, thinking he was John McEnroe, came unstuck. I played a nice little drop shot. He thought he could get to the net. I went sliding in to hit a ball over, and I couldn't stop. So I slid over the net and just stuck my hand out. I've still got the scar there now. Um, and I went, oh, that, that's a bit sore. And then it showed that, unfortunately, he'd fractured, fractured his wrist. The weather did relent eventually, allowing the two teams to squeeze in another one day to keep the fans happy, which in turn allowed Sky, and in particular Tony Gregg, to try and do things a bit differently. It's actually a pretty good view from up here. I've got a few uh, guys up there with me who have been watching the cricket from this particular tree for years, and, uh, and it looks pretty good. I'm looking almost down the line. Uh, Ricky, have you, how long have you been watching cricket from up here for? Every day I'm smart, since small boy. Beautiful, lovely shade. I mean, how do you get a drink, though? What happens then? Well, man, I'm ready to drink a calm down. Climb down and go and get yourself a rum or something. You've got to be a bit careful you don't drink too much, otherwise you might fall out of the tree. I can't remember whose idea it was to get Greggy to go up the tree, but all I remember was that when somebody did suggest it, he instantly said, yes, great idea, because that was Greggy. He was up for anything. Well, that's the situation from up here. Lovely view from over the top of the side screen. It's back to Tony Cozier in the country box. It was typical of Sky's determination to give the British public something different from the rather reserved style of the BBC. I don't know how long cricket's been played in Guyana, for example, but TWI in conjunction with Sky have actually brought pictures from Guyana into the lounge room in England, and that's got to be good for cricket. I mean, where have you guys been? <laughs> well, I've been watching Sky, actually, I'll tell you that, but um, and I've enjoyed it in some ways, but I, I think it's slightly overdue. It. it really was a continuation of the style that I'd introduced um, 12 years before on Channel 9 with World Series Cricket. We always wanted to do it differently to the way the BBC had done it. Obviously, with the huge advantage is that we're in the West Indies where it's gloriously sunny, there's a beach down the road, and the matches are being played in English time from about 3 o'clock in the afternoon till 11 o'clock at night. It's prime time television. By March the 23rd, though, Greg was down from his tree and everyone had their serious game faces on as Gooch won what seemed to be an important toss. We will field <laughs> <laughs> okay. It wasn't going to be a good pitch. It was going to be a bit of a minefield. 
you, you get a feel for a pitch and it, it didn't look like it was going to be a great pitch. Caught him. That's why Stewart's there. Oh, that's one ball. He's gone. He's out. Caught behind. That's the end of Richie Richardson. A great wicket for England. In no time at all, the West Indies were in serious trouble as they slumped to 29 for five. He's leg before, padding away. That's the fifth wicket. What a collapse. Well, we got quite excited. I mean, 29 for five. You know, we were looking at sort of bowling them out for 60, 70. In the West Indies dressing room, with Viv Richards missing the game Desmond Haynes was in charge, the atmosphere was fraught. I don't think they were a happy camp then either. I think there was quite a bit going on behind the scenes because uh, Viv wasn't well, but there, were, there was moanings and there seemed to be sort of uh, quite a bit of disharmony uh, around them at the moment in time. Yes, I would be a bit concerned. And the, who, who wants to lose the, uh, the first test match? You know, me as captain, you know, who, who want to do that? Any team at 27 for five before lunch, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? What do you say? So the new batsman is Gus Logie. And what a crisis for him here now. Well, somehow the West Indies managed to recover thanks mainly to a brilliant innings from local boy Gus Logie. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. Magnificently cut away there by Logie. Into the fence it goes. Undervalued. There were two Trinidadians that played with West Indies in that era, Gus Logie and Larry Gomes. Both of them did yeoman service to the West Indies in those days. Well, he's pulled that into the gap and down to the boundary. Lovely shot. And Gus Logie's innings must have been a fantastic innings to come in at that stage and to get those runs on under those conditions. He's got him, I dropped him! What a miss that was! Yeah, I remember it well, because I, I dropped him when he was about 20 or 30, diving to my right-hand side. So that's probably, I think it's the only drop catch in my test career that actually badly affected a test match. And England have put one down. That was a vital opportunity. That moment sticks in my head. And we did have him on the rack, and we let him get away. Got that one away beautifully for four. Magnificent cut shot. Into the fence it goes. That was a magnificent shot. It's brought up his half century as well. He came to the party on his home ground. So it's conditions that he was actually quite familiar with. Got us to a place of relative safety. <laughs> he's got that away and he's got him. He's out, caught the gully. Magnificently taken on 98. Logie was eventually last out, too short of his 100, with the West Indies on 199. But as Wisden reports, Gooch and Larkins put it in perspective by batting through the first 53 overs of England's reply. He's got that one away nicely down towards the boundary, into the fence it goes. Lovely shot from Larkins. Just keep batting. As long as any sort of lead, we were going to be in with a great chance. That's a good shot. Straight into the gap at mid-on. Between them, Gooch and Larkins put on 112 for the first wicket, and later, at 195 for two, England seemed set to bat the West Indies out of the game. But then... Oh, what a beautiful ball. Big appeal. He's given out. He's got it. A magnificent delivery, that one, from Ian Bishop. And Gooch's innings has come to an end. It was the start of a collapse and another missed opportunity. Oh, and it's out. He's got it. Best ball is gone. The ball hit the glove, went straight up in the air. Bailey on his way, first ball. This is Bishop. Oh, and that's it. He's got him out. It's hit him with the stumps have gone down. Lamb is out. Lamb's leg stump is lying on the ground. And England all of a sudden finding things very tough indeed. We all should have gone and got more runs and, and got a bigger target. 288 all out meant England's lead was just 89, nowhere near what it might have been. And when Greenwich and Haynes knocked that off with apparent ease, England's chances of going 2-0 up in the series looked to be ebbing away. Fine shot by Haynes. Another boundary. Once again, the wheel of fortune turned. Well, by he's got him, he's out, he's going to go in. That is a good delivery from Malcolm. Oh, he's got him, he's got to be out, yes, LBW, good night, Charlie, he's on his way. Oh, and that's out too, Charlie, he's bowled him, he's gone, it's kept low, it's 
knocks it down. Well, could this test match be over today? What an unbelievable performance. I think Devon did shake them up. He was quick, I mean, and he was raw. I was pretty strong. He fits, could bowl, you know, from the first ball of the morning to the, probably the last ball at the close-up play, I could still keep the pace. He's caught him, a cut, and taken it for a slip. Malcolm gets his fourth wicket. Look, all I need is some just positive vibes, and, you know, I'm, I'm a serious part of the team, and I actually thought, OK, this proved my point, I can bowl. Haynes and Greenwich, one of the best opening partnerships that the game's ever seen, and seeing them sort of apprehensive by one of our bowlers running in and making them think about things other than scoring runs which was it was nice that because that's all the England bats were worried about. In the air, got him well taken Larry, good catch, magnificent catch, just outside off stuff. Not only did he bowl quick, when he got it right he swung it out uh, to the right hander um, and he had some magic moments. Then that is England's hero, Devon Malcolm. Listen, I love the West Indies jumping around because they don't normally jump around. We had a, someone with a bit of pace, so it, it was great. Oh, that will look straight, and that is out, and that's the end of the West Indies innings. Malcolm finished with figures of six for 77, his first five-wicket haul in an innings at test level. And everyone who had scoffed, rather, when he'd made his debut in the previous summer's Ashes and taken one for 166, were now eating their words. And the total is 239, which means that England now have 151 runs to win this test match and go two up in the series. It wasn't for granted we were going to get it, you know, but we were all confident enough that we would get the runs. We knew the wicket was deteriorating badly, and we knew that if they bowled a length, it would be hard work for the rest is history. <laughs> Oh, and straight away a nasty delivery there. Gooch surprised by that one. It hit him on the glove. It really did rear up. Almost uh, a loosener by Ezra Mosley. It was just a, a length ball and just took off and hit me here. Now, in a funny sort of way, on your fingers when you're batting, if there's pain, that's not the worst thing. When it goes numb, that's when you know you're in trouble. OK, when you can't feel anything, OK? So it went numb, thought nothing of it. Next over, hit me in exactly the same spot. And just when he moves out of man, he's taken Gooch on the hand. That's the second time Mosley has taken Gooch on the hand, on that left hand. He was struggling horribly, and he knew, you know, he knew the second time it was serious, serious. It was pretty close to the wicket, so I, I heard a knock, and it, it sung as though that something was broken, you know. It just didn't sound right when he got hit on his hand. And that's a nasty blow. Summoning the assistants from the dressing room. And that's when Laurie Brown came on the field. He took the glove off, and he's got hold of my hand like this, and he says, I think that's dislocated. OK? And he starts to pull my finger. He starts to pull it, and that's the picture. And I won't, on camera, say, what I said. <laughs> I don't think so, Laurie. Graham Gooch does not make a song and dance over pain. I played with Graham at Essex. Graham could get peppered by whoever, and he wouldn't make any kind of song and dance. And there's that iconic photo of Laurie Brown going like that to, to Gucci on his hand, and Gucci in absolute agony. And when you see that, you know Graham Gooch has done something serious. And he's going off. Sight. Yes, he's going off. Well, that really is a blow, literal and uh, figurative. Well, then I had to go off, and then, well, it's, that changed everything. With Gooch retired hurt, Alex Stewart was joined by Alan Lamb, and by lunch, England was 73 for one, and it was very obvious that the West Indies, and in particular Desmond Haynes, captaining in the absence of Viv Richards, was starting to feel the pressure. Luckily, he's got a touch onto it. Well, Alex Short is being upset by something out there. There was a lot of verbal. I, they, they gave Alec a lot of verbal. And I had to come down and just tell Alec to relax. And I, I started climbing into Desmond. You know, I said, if you want to give anyone any verbal, you speak to me. This is Mosley. One ball to go this over. And straight away, the bouncer whizzing over the top of that white crash helmet. It was never anything that was personal. I, I just told him that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he can't handle the short ball. And so long as I'm in charge of the team, he's going to get plenty of them. And I made that very clear to him. 
He was expressing his thoughts on what should be happening, how I should be playing or why I shouldn't be playing. Um, and I, so I listened, you know, you have to remember this is just my second test match and I'm there, he's a great, you know, I've always looked up to and still do. Haynes was spoken to by Lamb and then Haynes was quoted afterwards as saying that he'll continue to, to allow his players to talk to the batsman as long as he lives. I always believe that a sledge should be something that you can have a drink with someone at the end of the game. And even though I know that a lot of people look at it from the way there was nothing offensive, really, it was just a matter of gamesmanship, you know, letting him know that we are in a tight situation here. And if you come around here thinking that you're going to come on the front foot and we are going to bowl some trout fish deals with you because really and truly you can't handle it. The barrage of short stuff, though, had to wait because just as the players left the field, it started to rain. Port of Spain, Queen's Park, you could see over the hills, you could actually see the rain coming. Well, it rained for about, I'm guessing, four hours. And that made all the difference. There seemed to just be this black cloud over the ground. And over there, you could see it was as bright as a daisy. Eventually, after four hours had been lost, it stopped, and the umpires decided it was fit enough to play. There were 30 overs left, and England needed 78 to go two up in the series. So, was it fit to play? Absolutely, absolutely fit. Well, the answer as I sit here now is it? Yes, we were, it was, yeah. I know it wasn't fit for play. You know, when Ian Bishop ran and tried to bowl, you know, you were hearing slosh, 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 slosh. And I think that we only got put on the pressure to play is because it was the first time that we have actually been televising cricket in the Caribbean. Despite their protests, the West Indies were ordered out into the middle and the umpires called play. What followed was still being talked about when Brian Lara gave the MCC's Spirit of Cricket lecture over 25 years later. This is maybe the most embarrassing moment for me as a young West Indian watching a West Indies team time-wasting, playing the game in the way that it should never, ever be played. Having a few problems on the way in there, it's quite damp. Walsh carrying on a little bit about uh, the area. I can't stand up here. I want sawdust. So then they, they said they want sawdust. No sawdust to be found. It took about what seemed to be about 10 minutes to even find any sawdust. So there's sawdust out on the centre now. Pretty solid sawdust. They've uh, obviously got a lot of bags of it out the back there, and um, that area is pretty wet indeed. So they wasted time. Ian Bishop marked his run-up out about four times. The uh, delay at the moment is because of the little guy who's uh, getting rid of that uh, wheelbarrow full of uh, what was full of uh, sawdust. It's now empty. Then he started a bowl, and three times he just went, no, it's too wet, can't bowl. You can see the water actually splashing there. He's saying he can't bowl. They were just time-wasting, you know, absolutely time-wasting. What a carry-on, my goodness. Do you think you'd be carrying on like that if England wanted 30 runs to win and there were the last two tail-enders at the wicket, he'd be racing in and bowling at about 85 mile an hour? We delayed the game. The tactics were, were there to, to delay the game as much as we could, as much as we'd be allowed to do it without breaking the law. Plenty of sawdust there. 22 minutes have gone past now and they've bowled 1.5 overs. That's enough to drive Jeff Boycott mad. You know, it got ridiculous. I mean, six or seven overs an, an hour. I mean, he just slowed everything down, which was basically was cheating. I think Gooch is getting a little bit uh, impatient about uh, this carry-on as well. You're obviously trying to, play within the rules, kill as much time as possible. It's not the first time it's been done, and it's not the last time it's been done. As you look back now, was that the worst you've ever seen an opposition perform on the field as far as, well, I mean, you've used the word, cheating? Well, uh, they didn't play by the rules and, and uh, the umpires allowed them to get away with it. There comes a time when the umpires have got to speak to the fielding side, whether it's England or West Indies, and say, look, we're playing cricket here. I know it's a bit wet, now get a move on, get the sawdust down and let's get on with the game of cricket. Ultimately, the end justified the means. Well, you... You can put it and you can word it how you like, but all I said to you is that I played within the rules. I didn't do anything that Gooch, after speaking to me, wouldn't, do, wouldn't have done because he, he was captain in England. 
So I played the game within the rules. But whatever the legitimacy of the tactics, they worked, as with the light fading, the runs just wouldn't come quick enough. It's the end of the over, and once again, the umpires are going to offer the light to the batsman. The light was getting pretty poor. I mean, you could hardly see capes the other end, let alone some guy bowling at 19 miles an hour. It was getting really difficult. I was running gloves out, and Gucci and Mickey's message was, you know, I remember the last one, they said, really is up to you. Can you see the ball? If you can stay out, you stay out, please. He's saying, come in. They want to come in, it seems to me. I think Cape was saying, I don't know what you're on about, Captain. I really don't understand. Then Mickey Stewart or, Gr or Grant Gritchard, they're both standing up. One of them's going, stay out there. The other one's going, come in. But at exactly the same time. Of course, all I can see is arms waving around. They can't, you can't tell and they, 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 any communication from them because you can't see it. It was too dark. There seems to be a great mix-up out there at the moment. I don't really understand what's going on. I was keen to go on. I was keen to just keep going. Um, but obviously we were one nil up in the series, so we didn't want to risk everything. If it was light, I'd say, no problem. I said, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. But I said, it's pretty difficult to see now. So between us, we talked it through and we said, come on, we'll have to go. I wanted to keep going, um, but I said, fine, we, then, we, then we go off. But uh, if he wanted to stay, I would have been happy to stay. It looks to me as if Capel's coming in. That's the end of the day's play. So the match has ended in a draw, 120 for five. Yeah, it was like a defeat because we, 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 we thought we were going to win it and uh, a quite deflating dressing room. There was a lot of anger with the time wasting uh, on our balcony, that's for sure. Looking forward to the next test match now. <laughs> well, I don't think I'll be playing, but uh, I'll be there supporting the lads anyway. There's a great spirit at the side. OK, cheers. Thanks, Tom. Right, well, thanks for going along and having a talk to us. Well, the news here is that Graham Gooch, that he had a broken hand, he's just confirmed that he probably will not, in fact, he almost certainly will not be playing in the next test match. And at the end of the day, he brought the players off the ground because it simply was too dark. Not winning at Trinidad and Graham being injured, I think that was that was quite a, a you know a tough thing to take mentally. That was that was difficult. If that rain hadn't come, it would have been tough on that pitch at the end, but it was eminently winnable. On Pictures from Paradise, we told you how England stunned the cricketing world by winning the opening test of their 1990 tour of the West Indies. Yes, he's misfielded, and England won. Fantastic. How they should have taken a 2-0 lead in Trinidad, only for a tour-ending injury to Graham Gooch. He's taken Gooch on the hand, that's the second time. The weather. There seemed to just be this black cloud over the ground, and it just rained and rained and rained. And then West Indian time-wasting denied them. What a carry-on, my goodness. And, of course, all this drama was being played out on TV back at home thanks to the revolutionary coverage being provided by the fledgling Sky TV. We were in a battle with a rival satellite company. Six months earlier, I'm playing Durham against York. Now, there I am playing against Viv Richards. Devon Malcolm has struck a mighty blow for England. That's the second time Mosley has taken Gooch on the hand. Gooch appeal, Ben Richards has given him. The umpire wasn't going to give that. Well, now it's late March 1990, and the tour has arrived in Barbados for a warm up game against the island, a one day international, and then the fourth test. And England's mounting injury crisis means that all of a sudden a dramatic recall for David Gower is in the offing. When the injuries came, I discussed it with, with Graham and Mickey and I said, listen, I think we need someone in now who's played test cricket and I wanted David to come back. Reaction to the suggestion amongst the management was lukewarm, but it was agreed that he should play in the warm-up game. We wanted to continue it was with the same people who had prepared for the trip, had achieved success up to that date on the trip, and continued doing what we'd done right from day one when the tour started. As it happened, Gower only made four, and the notion of a glorious return to the England side was quietly binned, although that wasn't the picture the News of the World readers got. I was quite pally with Graham, and uh... It was just coming up to my deadline, and I thought I got a stare that he would play. So date on the paper was April 1st, and I said, this is no April Fool's. David Gar will be playing in the Test match, and I got it 
absolutely, completely wrong. And that's a pretty decent summing up of how the whole game went for England. Lamb, captain in place of Gooch and without the also injured Fraser, won the toss and for some reason put the West Indies in. It didn't work as they made 446 with the extraordinary Carlisle Best making 164 of them. That's a good shot. Four more runs to Carlisle Best. First of all, he had a toothpick. He used to bat with a toothpick. Uh, but he'd also commentate as well. Say if Devon Malcolm was at the end of his run, he'd say Malcolm at the end of his run runs in his running into Carlisle Best. Best was hit it for four and he'd go, Bessie, what a shot. Four runs through the covers. And he'd be talking to himself like this. You know, I'm at short there, I've not come across this before. He's got that through the gap magnificently for four. He was absolutely mad. He used to commentate as the bowler. He used to say the bowler's running in and Carlisle Best hits it for four. Great cover drive. Oh, he's pulled that one magnificently. Take that. Into the gap, into the fence for four. Carlisle Best is on fire. That was Carlisle. Um, he constantly talking to himself. That was just his, his thing. That was just his way. There it goes, and that'll be a very popular half century. He was different, wasn't he? He was unique. He was also the local lad there, and it was just such an atmosphere. They were up on top of the roofs and jumping up and down. It was a real scene. He played brilliantly with real flair, real Caribbean flair. He's pulled it away magnificently, a great shot. Into the fence, down at square leg, he's made his maiden century. What a knock it's been. This is a great moment in the life of Carlisle Best. For all the eccentricity of Best, though, his was not the innings that really caught the eye. Viv Richards, one of the greatest batsmen of all time, has just arrived at the centre. Mr Cool himself. In April 1990, there was no doubt about it. Isaac Vivian Alexander Richards was, without doubt, the greatest living batsman playing cricket at the time. His mere presence was enough to turn the legs of some strong men to jelly. But in Jamaica, he'd been got out in both innings by Devon Malcolm. Viv Richards going for the pull shot, and Devon Malcolm has struck a mighty blow for England. Got Viv Richards out once, twice. No, 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 no. That doesn't happen very often. Bowled him, he's got him! The king of the West Indies is on his way back to the pavilion. There was still a level of respect for the master blaster, you know? All those guys, you got Viv Richards out in your heart. Have I really done that? But at the end of the day, you know, you can't celebrate too much, but in my heart, boy, there were some serious celebrations there. The problem, if it was a problem, was that at the end of that game, Devon, very much the man of the moment, was put up to speak to the press. One of the press guys um, reckon, um, Dave, you got Viv Richards out in both innings. Um, do you believe you've got the formula to get Viv out? And I went, hmm, naively, I said, rhetorically, I said, oh, I probably have, actually. I've got him out twice. The headlines on the sport pages was Malcolm, the chemist, who's got the formula to get Viv Richards out. I was teach. All ends up. Viv was not impressed. The next test, of course, in Guyana was washed out, so there was no chance for him to put the record straight, and he then missed Trinidad through illness. But when Richie Richardson was caught behind of Gladstone Small on day one, everyone knew something momentous was about to happen. He's under a little bit of pressure. He hasn't had much batting, but he is a great player. We knew that one way or the other, somebody was going to dominate. In the left corner, Devon Malcolm. In the right corner, Vivian Richards, representing the West Indies. It was almost like Viv had a point to prove, that he wasn't going to take a backward step against this new fiery Devon Malcolm. And uh, to take up the England bowling, here is Devon Malcolm. I ran in, first ball. As you can imagine, it was going to be upstairs. Bounce out, Vivi. Vivi just got with ease. Bang. Six. And that's gone away for six. Dropped beyond the boundary. And you know what Viv was like, you know what? The water on the pitch does is gardening. The man passed, get close by me, he just said, showtime. Magnificent shot. That's brought the crowd to life. Richards now already going. Next ball, ran up, another bouncer again. 
stoppage over the slip cylinder, Jack Russell's head. And rolling away towards the boundary, the contest continues, and Tutor Richards. Final ball of the over, a run up, a little bit quicker, at Vivi's nose this time. Again, Vivi hooked me for six. It's gone away, in the air, it's gone over, it's gone for another one. What a contest we've got here. He ran past me and said, that should be four more, man. But I hope the captain keep you on. I said, 19, I've never been chirped so much in my life. <laughs> Vivi took 19 runs off the over. Viv was finally out for 70, while Devon finished the innings with figures of naught for 142. Quite a come down from his six for in Trinidad, and significantly, the West Indies were in control of the game. Having said that, England didn't fold. Thanks to Lamb's 119 and Robin Smith's 62, they sailed past the follow-on, and at 268 for three were dreaming of parity, if not a first innings lead. But a clatter of wickets, the last six fell for 61, meant that the West Indies were able to build on a lead of 88 and declare on 267 for eight, of which Haynes made 109. There comes, there comes the declaration, and that leaves England 356 runs to win this match. England had a day and 50 minutes to score 356, or more realistically, to survive and make sure the series would at least be shared. Their mission could hardly have got off to a worse start with Larkins out second ball. And for Wayne Larkins, out for his second duck in the match, a pair. He was replaced by Rob Bailey, who was just starting to find his feet when... Oh, he's got him, good behind him, and they tried, huge appeal, and then Richards has given him. I tell you what, the umpire wasn't going to give that. Richards, oh, he ran down the wicket, doing that little jiggle with his hand. I remember Curtly running into bowl. Uh, the ball went down the leg side. As it went down, I, I pulled my hands away slightly, I flicked my thigh pad, and taken by Geoffrey Dujon down the... Um, Lake side. I realized that it had hit something. What it had hit was really not up to me, but it was up to the umpire. But if I heard it hit something, I didn't see what it hit, I've got to appeal. This was a very controversial decision. There can be absolutely no doubt about the fact that the umpire was walking away. Lloyd Barker basically shook his head. And then Viv, who's standing at first slip, a sort of massive appeal, you know, one of the all-time great appeals, has gone from first slip sort of around to gully, around cover, coming in to short extra cover, coming up to the bowling umpire, appealing, and then Lloyd Barker went, that's out. It looks clearly as if it's hit his thigh pad. And whether he did or not hit it, look at Richard, look at Richard. Oh, dear, how can you put an umpire under pressure like that? And I remember looking up and thinking, no, this just isn't right. Have a look at the face of Bailey. He cannot believe it. Richards at this stage is almost down the other end of the ground. I think Lloyd Barker was just pressured, pressured into it. I can tell you what I remember now. I wish there was the RS. The crowd was baying. Everybody was shouting, including the players, not just Viv. I was concentrating on my decision. At first, I wasn't sure. Then I thought, yes, he did it. I reviewed it on television a number of times since then, and I, I am not sure. I didn't hit it now. I'd have been giving it that one these days, Charles, I'd, straight away. Reaction to the incident was immediate. In the eyes of the English journalists, at least, Viv was now public enemy number one for what was seen as a way over the top appeal. In The Times, Simon Barnes wrote about Viv's yelling, finger flicking charge up the wicket that conned an indirect decision from poor Lloyd Barker, while Mike Selvey, in The Guardian, called it a demented and intimidating charge. Up to this day, I would maintain that it's the blind side and someone had a little flick. Yeah. And honestly, I thought he nicked it. Yeah. I thought he nicked it and um, I persisted with the with uh, the appeal, yeah. um, and Barker gave him out. For all the heated discussion and views expressed through the various media outlets, though, the comment which attracted the most attention came from Chris Martin Jenkins on the BBC. What Christopher said was that uh, 
a previously good umpire or a very good umpire was pressured into changing his decision. Back in London, the World Service, BBC World Service, have a listen across the line into Broadcasting House. And they're away in Bush House and they say, oh, that's a good piece, we'll use that for our bulletins. And in the, in the early morning in Barbados, it comes back to, uh, back to the West Indies. It did not go down well and the next day, which happened to be a rest day in the test, saw the local phone-ins incandescent with rage. It was described as the Martin Jenkins affair. You know, people were being asked, they rang in, I have an opinion about the Martin Jenkins affair. Martin Jenkins was now the centre of the row, and it all ended with umpire Lloyd Barker serving a writ for defamation. Apart from the revelation that in England, innings can last longer than the time it takes to walk to the bar and back, the West Indies series has opened a second front of the war between the commentators. Christopher Martin Jenkins, the eminently urbane voice of the cricket establishment, has been sent a libel writ after he questioned an umpire's decision to give an England batsman out. He said, I changed my decision. I didn't remember making a decision and saying not out. They, I guess they interpreted the fact that I started to move away as having said not out, which wasn't quite true. I don't know if it was before the next ball was bowled or the ball after, and Lloyd Parker said to me, did you think he hit it? I went, no, he didn't. I don't remember that, that conversation. I certainly don't remember that conversation. It was something of a relief for everyone then, when the game eventually resumed on day five. Oh, he's in the air, Richard has got him! Stewart and Lamb were sent on their way relatively quickly, and with England 97 for five, the West Indies were closing in on a quick kill and an early flight to Antigua. Except Robin Smith and Jack Russell had other ideas. That's well played, right in behind that one. They were still together at lunch, well, that's a magnificent shot. They were still together at tea. That's well left. And they were still together with 45 minutes to go until the close. Were you starting in the West Indies camp to panic? Yes, uh, with, especially with, with, with Robin Smith there. Tremendous effort by Robin Smith for the second time in this match. Come on, says Jack Russell, fight it out. They were playing so well. I really thought we'd hold on there. And that's a superb half century, greeted by great cheers from the England spectators around the ground. It was so tense in the dressing room. You know, can we hang in there? Can we hang in there? And he's taken that on the side of the head. Bishop just injecting a little more life now, a little more pace. Unfortunately, when, uh, you know, when the new ball came, it was a different story. So we do have this new ball coming now. With it, Robin and I having batted that period of time, that was their next um, big hope, if you like, the new ball. Kirtley Ambrose. Bowled him! <laughs> likes it. Kirtley Ambrose likes it. And Jack Russell's long vigil ends. I was out to a scooter. I was out to the lowest bouncing ball of my career. Well, what an agonising way for a fine innings to end. It wasn't that long to go. You know, the light was coming in. Shadows were coming down, and we were gone past five o'clock now. Um, that I thought we could do it, um, but we lost a few, few more wickets quite quickly. Ambrose to Hussain. Good ball, big up got him out of the W. He's got him. Clapped him with the Yorker. Once uh, we got the first wicket, we smelled victory. We weren't going to drop any catches. We weren't going to, you know, we were going to attack. This is the last ball of the over. On the pair, he's given him out of the Within the blinking of an eye, it was all over as Ambrose took five wickets in five overs with the new ball to finish with what would end up being career best figures of eight for 45. Going in at two, you're thinking, can we, can we? And then Amby does what he's done for so many years and um, change the game. It's over. The West Indies have won by 164 runs. The Stampede. Eight wickets for Ambrose, and the West Indies have won the fourth test match in the Cable and Wireless series. It's one all, and Kurt the Ambrose is the centre of attention, you might say. The series was now level at one all.
Well, England were bowled out at just before half past five on that last afternoon, but they had no time to lick their wounds because they had to get straight to the airport to get a flight to Antigua for the next test match, which started in just over 36 hours' time. Now, that was tough for England, but it was a nightmare for Gary Francis and his TV crew. We hired a plane to take the kit around the island. It was a Convair. I think it was born in the either the 40s or the 50s. It was ancient. Um, a tired old bird is what the pilot actually called it before we took it for the first time. Also, we weren't sure exactly how much all our kit weighed, and there was a limit of 11,000 pounds, which is about five and a half tons. And we only found out we were within the limit when we loaded it for the first time, and it came to five tons. In the air, Richards has got him. He's fumbled it, but he's got him out caught. If the cameras were ready, England, in all reality, weren't. They were bowled out for 260 and then 154, while the West Indies only batted the once, scoring 446. He's got a magnificent 100, Gordon Greenwich. Which was based on an opening stand of 298 between Haynes and Greenwich, who both got big hundreds. Well played, Desmond Haynes. They treated their bowling attack like it was a schoolboy attack. That's a huge hit. When we got to Antigua, along with the schedule as well, which was really tough, the actual logistical schedule, I think when we got to that last match, um, I think we'd, we'd, uh, we'd run out of gas, really. If the cricket was all pretty predictable, an incident on the second morning was far from it. As the West Indies took to the field to polish off England's first innings, it was suddenly noticed that someone was missing from their lineup. Well, the news from the centre is that Desmond Haynes, in fact, is in charge out there. Viv Richards is not on the centre. We haven't got a reason for you yet. We'll let you know just as soon as we find out. It must have been a Saturday because the, the Sunday boys were there. We were vaguely aware that Viv hadn't come onto the field. Desmond Haynes was leading out the West Indies. I thought, that's a bit odd. Looked round and there's Viv in the back of the commentary box, not changed, wearing black jeans and a T-shirt. And then suddenly... He's in there and he's going berserk, storming at Jim Lawton. I gather one of our number, who shall not be named, had shown Vivian something that had been written by James Lawton. Jim had asked him a question the previous day about his V sign to the crowd. Viv had lost his temper then and said, you write anything about that and I'll come back and whack you. Jim, being a very good journalist, of course did write something about that. And what's more, it appeared on the front page of the Daily Express with a very large headline, Captain Viv blows his top. He kept referring to himself in the third person, which is never a good side. This Viv is mad, Viv is very angry. There are a lot of things that you know, has been said in the papers about the way Viv Richards handle things, you know, but uh, the most important thing is that uh, we are victorious and I cannot see beyond that. You know, if you, you can talk what you like about Viv Richards, you can talk what you like about the West Indies cricket team. I've got blinkers on at this particular moment. I'd like to think, you know, that uh, we're reasonably confident. You can write whatever you want to write. We are pretty confident, you know, that we are still a good team. Well, England finally headed for home on April the 18th, 1990, just about three months since they'd first set foot in the Caribbean. Now, get down your wisdom for that tour, and what does it tell you? Of a test series and a one-day series, both lost, surely a story of failure. But is that really fair? I think we were proud of the way we played because no one gave us a chance. We won the first test match, which was great. We could have won at Trinidad, that would have put us two up. With two to play, that would have been superb. So if we'd have come away with a draw, probably would have been a fair result. We introduced some new players, which was brilliant. Nasser turned out to be a wonderful test cricketer for England. Alex Stewart, one of the all-time greats. Jack Russell. And we proved that, you know, we could stand up to the best. The team moved forward a lot. I think we won a lot of fans over. Graham Gooch's way was working and it was a new dawn in some way, so it was good. There were more positives than negatives, definitely. They played hard in the field, we played it hard in the field, and, and there's nothing more to it. I mean, whatever was written... You have no agreement? Of course not. I mean, you know, that's cricket. Everyone sort of looked and said, listen, we gave it our best shot. We can come back with a result, but I think we came back with a lot of pride. Cricket became, you know, not just a summer sport, 
people would come up and go, well, where, where are you in the winter and what's the time difference and is that on Sky and what time can we watch it? Hello and welcome to this first Sky telecast. Today we're at Sabina Park here in Jamaica. You look back on it and you do think, how on earth did we do that? Because it, it was so new and it was so far from anything really that had been done before. 250 live hours of cricket from the West Indies. In the air, got him, well taken, Larry. Yes, he's got his out right out. This is a great moment in the life of Carlisle Best. So that was the start of it all. Um, and more and more people, yes, were coming up to talk about in the winter. Magnificent shot. Well played, the vice captain. Malcolm gets his fourth wicket. But within two years, we were doing the same job in India. And soon after that, cricket was being done in the same way from all the places that had never had cricket before. He's got it. It was a bold gamble um, by us, um, and it paid off. Right, well, that's the situation from up here. It's back to Tony Cozier in the country box. 